to move on, we have uh, Dr. Beth Ventura. She's going to talk to us about the career opportunities in animal behavior and welfare, because I know we have a lot of undergraduate students, postgraduate students, early career researchers in our midst, who probably for the first time might be attending a meeting like this. And I think it is an opportunity for us to talk about what it entails instead of just joining a meeting and, and at the end of the day, don't know, you know, what you can get out of it or what you can make out of it. And also there could be uh, in our midst, uh, people that already have interest, but they don't know where to go. They don't know who, how to go about it. Uh, so this is the opportunity for you to learn about uh, the career opportunities and the paths that you can go through. So uh, Abayomi, uh, Tom Mori will be moderating the session for us. Abayomi, over to you. Thank you. Well, my name is Abayomi Tom Mori, and I'll be moderating this talk session on career opportunities in animal behavior and welfare by Dr. Beth Ventura. I'd like to give a brief introduction about the speaker. Dr. Beth Ventura is a senior lecturer in animal behavior and welfare at the University of Lincoln, United Kingdom. Originally from the United States, Dr. Betts worked primarily in Canada and the US before relocating to England in 2022. Prior to her current role, she served as a teaching associate professor at the University of Minnesota, where she developed and taught courses on animal welfare, applied ethology, and human-animal interactions for thousands of students. Our research interests encompass both the animal and human side of animal welfare, and she has worked with livestock, horses, and captive white animals in her career. She is especially interested in how different stakeholder groups interpret and communicate about animal welfare challenges and perceived barriers to, to resolution. But she also loves working in applied research areas, which involves environmental enrichment, pain assessment, and relief, and more recently, cognition. She sits on the ethics community of the International Society for Applied Ethology, a member of the Animal Dairy Science Association, and also an associate editor for the Journal of Applied Animal Welfare Science. Dr. Bert also co-founded and facilitates the Animal Welfare Education Community of Kratis, which is a grassroots community for those interested in teaching applied ethology and welfare which now serves over 100 members based in 40 plus. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me join you today in this wonderful meeting. Um, I'm here just to share a little bit about what I've learned in my career so far about the types of things available to do um, if you are interested in behavior and welfare, uh, and especially since um, there are so many um, new scientists or new or scientists who are relatively um, at the start of their careers. Um, hopefully this information will be of use uh, to some of you. For some of you, you might already know this information, um, but for hopefully others that will be uh, very useful. So I thought I'd start um, and break this down in, in a couple of chunks. The first is I'd like to, when I talk with my students um, they're, and they're interested in animal welfare and animal behavior, I first like to open the conversation by just making sure that um, we all have this kind of shared awareness of the different types of disciplines that are available to people who are interested in behavior and welfare, because there are a few of them and they do intersect a little bit, but based on maybe your interests, you may find yourself attracted to one of the disciplines a little bit more than others. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, species considerations. If people are particularly passionate or interested in working with certain animals over others, whether that um, has any bearing on the types of career opportunities that someone may consider. Uh, and then finally, because it's, it's the area of careers that I'm most familiar with, um, I'll share just um, some considerations for those who are interested in preparing um, or, or making themselves as ready as possible to be strong academics um, or do some sort of um, academic career. Um, and I will kind of put a disclaimer on this. 
uh, because a lot of this talk will be shaped by my own backgrounds and my um, experiences. And since I was born in the United States and I've worked mainly there as well as in Canada, although I now work in the United Kingdom. So some of this will relate also to European um, kind of career preparation tracks. Um, much of what I'll share generally will relate especially to opportunities in those regions if you're interested in them. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, let's talk different disciplines involving animal behavior and welfare. So folks who are later on in their careers, you'll already know this, but if you are a student uh, in, in the um, joining us today, hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, so obviously in most, um, ob yeah, most obviously the, the discipline of applied ethology, which is all about what International Society for Applied Ethology or ISEE is all about, and the kind of interwoven discipline with animal welfare science. These generally are best suited for people who are interested in careers that involve focus on welfare of animals or behavior of animals that are in captive, human managed captive settings in some respect. Maybe they're domesticated um, animals, perhaps they're not. So maybe they're wild animals and they're in a, a rescue uh, situation or a rehabilitation situation or, you know, in a zoo or an aquarium. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing uh, work or study under, under these kind of, under this discipline, um, at least in the United States, uh, you would pursue uh, further study in these under uh, animal science departments uh, under universities, although it kind of varies depending on institution, and that's not necessarily always the case. Um, and in terms of the academic journals, where most of the behavior and the welfare research um, on captive animals uh, is published, a lot of it would be in um, the affiliated journal for ISAE, which is Applied Animal Behavior Science, but you may also find a lot of, of work in the Journal of Animal Welfare, which is affiliated with UFA, which is a great organization to know if you're not already familiar with it, uh, which is the University's Federation for Animal Welfare. Um, and then another common one um, is uh, JAWS, or the Journal for Applied Animal Welfare Science. Um, but applied ethology and welfare is not necessarily the only discipline for people interested in a career involving behavior of animals. Um, there's also just kind of more broadly the discipline of animal behavior. Um, so this might involve a lot more kind of basic science or fundamental science, trying to really understand who animals are and why they do the things they do. Um, so a lot of this, um, the focus of animal behaviorists, pure animal behaviorists will be dedicated to wild animals who are in the wild and not just the, the mammals and the birds, but all the way down to kind of the invertebrate uh, level. And so under um, universities, you can find people uh, studying and preparing for careers in animal behavior under lots of different university departments, psychology, biology, uh, excuse me, zoology, neuroscience, neurobiology, behavioral ecology, the kind of, the list kind of goes on. And there's, there's a few um, important professional organizations to be aware of, if that's something that you're particularly interested in. Uh, one is the Association for the Study of Animal Behavior, or ASAB. Another one is just broadly the Animal Behavior Society. Uh, and then in terms of, of journals, where a lot of that animal behavior research would be published in. Um, kind of a top one would be the, the Journal of Animal Behavior, although there are, there are lots of them. Uh, and then finally, um, there's if you're someone who's really interested in the intersection between humans and animals, um, there's a lot of overlap with the field of applied ethology and with animal welfare science, but there's also the dedicated field of anthrozoology, um, kind of so somewhat similar to the field of HAI or human animal interactions. And so if that's something that you're particularly interested in, um, the International Society for Anthrozoology 
uh, and then the International Association of Human Animal Interaction Organizations um, are two professional societies that I would encourage folks to look into um, and perhaps consider joining if this is again something that you're interested in for a career. Um, and then a very common uh, journal where a lot of the research in this area gets published is in the Journal of Anthrozoos, which is uh, pictured here. So uh, I generally encourage um, people who are, as they're working through figuring out where they're interested in directing their attention for a career to kind of, let's see, like shop a little bit um, online and, and try to see and go through the websites of some of these professional organizations just to see if those are um, possibly compelling uh, institutions to, to ultimately be involved with. And also those professional organizations uh, quite helpfully often will post uh, the type, different types of careers or job opportunities like the International Society for Applied Ethology website does, um, which also kind of gives people a good idea of the types of careers that might be available that are not necessarily immediately apparent. Um, so I'll move on now to just a, a few thoughts that um, I have about species considerations. So um, some people may be really quite interested and focused on livestock um, or, the, or the typical livestock species, and that's what they're passionate about, and you only want to work with livestock in your career. Others may be particularly focused on companion animals and dogs and cats, whether they're, you know, the dogs and cats or maybe more exotic animals. Um, this is something that uh, the students that I work with, um, a lot of them are extremely interested in dogs and cats and less so with the livestock, and I try to nudge them to, to, to be a little bit more open, um, although plenty of people have um, careers dedicated to working with pets. Um, but I just have a personal bias because I, I, when I was a, at the start of, of my education, I did not know I was interested in livestock animals at all. Um, and it wasn't until I got through university and was exposed to working with some of these animals that I became really quite interested in them. So I just encourage my students to keep a really open mind. Um, Others may be quite interested in, in horses and equines, others in research animals and laboratories, um, and then still others in, again, those, those captive wildlife animals. Um, and so for the next uh, couple of um, slides, I'm going to have a lot of, of text on these slides because it's gonna be kind of uh, like a non-exhaustive list of the types of careers that people might consider pursuing if they are interested in one of these types of you know species clusters um but the reality is that if you are interested in working in a behavior and welfare uh career field any of these species um there will be careers either on the educational side on the research side on the administrative side, um, uh, you can merge. Uh, if you're a veterinarian or you're considering becoming a veterinarian, you can merge. You can be a veterinary medicine working in any of these species and merging behavior with that. Um, all of these will have um, roles rel related to business or policy or even marketing. Um, and then, of course, all of them will also have animal husbandry and animal care types of roles available. Um, and I also want to note that there is a lot of overlap with species as well. And you definitely do not have to specialize in any single species or species kind of cluster. Um, and actually, I would recommend, especially to people who are um, uh, earlier on in their careers or if they're still in, um, in university, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend trying to focus in on one type of animal and building your career and your expertise just on that animal, because it possibly could limit the opportunities available to you later on. Okay, but let's say we are interested, for example, in livestock, and we're wondering what types of careers may be possible if you're interested in working with something to do with behavior or, or welfare or both of livestock species, whether that's cattle or goats or sheep or poultry or pigs or buffalo or, or any, any, any other farmed animal or um, fish, for example. 
Um, so first and maybe most obviously you can work directly for the sector or for the industry itself. Um, and that could be either um, sector specific organizations. So like in um, like the national milk producers uh, relative to each country that you might be uh, working in. Uh, you could also work for specific companies that are very, very global or very localized depending on where you are. So from a global level, companies like Cargill or Smithfield or Tyson, um, they have people that are involved in behavior and welfare um, on their staff. Um, you could also look into uh, companies, again, at the global, but also the, the national or the more local level that are involved in pharmaceutical production. Um, so Alanco or Boeing or Ingelheim, for example, um, or animal nutrition companies. I haven't listed any, but there are plenty of them, um, again, at the global, national or more local level. Um, you could also, there are animal welfare scientists who work for global purchasers of food, um, like Danone or McDonald's. Um, I even know someone who is an animal welfare scientist who works for Ikea, which when she first got hired uh, for this role, I was surprised because I hadn't thought of Ikea needing an animal um, welfare scientist or any animal welfare people on their staff. Um, if, if for those who don't know, if you don't know, Ikea is a really, really large furniture store, or at least that's how I think of them. Um, and they also sell food. They have cafeterias in all of their stores and they sell a lot of food. Um, and in fact, the, I think the last time I spoke to my colleague, she, she mentioned that they are the world's like sixth or seventh largest purchaser of food, um, which just blew my mind. So you can also kind of think outside the box. There's a lot of organizations that you might not think initially are involved with livestock animal welfare, but in fact have a really big role. So she helps work on their sustainability initiatives related to their food. Um, you can also, there are national and regional supermarket chains, especially um, in places that I've worked uh, who hire, uh, who do animal welfare assessment. Um, and so who hire and need animal welfare assistant, uh, not assistants, but um, scientists. <laughs> uh, you could work in government either involved directly in the auditing process, for example, um, uh, of, the, of the farms, as well as all the way through to the slaughter, um, slaughter process. Uh, you could work for academia. So you could work for a university um, or for a research institute if you are someone who is really passionate about continuing to do research, or if you're very passionate about teaching, um, academia might be a really good fit for you. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more about some things that might be important to consider um, if you are um, going for a career in academia. Um, you're also uh, able to work in the charity or the nonprofit sector. Um, the, the salary associated with nonprofit or charity work might be a little different than some of the other sectors, but for a lot of people, it can be a really good fit. Um, so examples of international charities could include things like World Animal Protection, Universities Federation for Animal Welfare, or which is UFA or IFA, along with like very localized um, charities. You could work and become an animal welfare assessor yourself. So you could work for um, either um, uh, basically third party, party auditors to um, assess farms that have kind of bought into this process who are looking for uh, kind of hopefully trying to achieve a higher level of welfare for their animals and then reassure the consumer that the animals are raised according to a, an extra set of standards than might be legally required. So in the States, a really common, or excuse me, in the United States, um, a really common one would be certified humane. In the United Kingdom, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals or RSPCA um, has a, a process through uh, RSPA, so, RSPCA approved, um, and then back to the US again, it, there's another organization called PACO. Um, and if you're already a veterinarian, you can also work very tightly with any of these kind of um, areas. 
Uh, and then finally, you can work more with directly with the animals themselves, either as an animal care technician um, or farm worker or manager. Uh, so if you're not interested in livestock, but you're considering working with companion animals, um, you can, uh, a lot of this is quite similar. You can, again, work for companies that uh, produce products like pet food um, or pet uh, pharmaceuticals. So Nestle Purina might be a really good example. Uh, they have positions for animal welfare scientists, for example. Again, you can work in government. You might be more involved in kind of inspection and regulation related to anti-cruelty laws that might be in place at the, in, at the, at, uh, at the not, excuse me, at the national level. Again, you could work in academia and as well as nonprofits or charities. There's also a lot more kind of charity level work on the companion animal side um, because there are a lot, depending on the country that you are in, there are a lot of animal rescues and shelter organizations um, that, ha that have layers of careers um, depending on what level you're interested in. There's also the increasing trend to relying on pets, um, or excuse me, certain animals, especially dogs, as um, service or assistant animals, or directly involved with um, therapy for people, for example, who are ailing or people who have um, uh, mental health issues or learning disabilities, that sort of thing. Um, and there's also a growing um, area for people who become um, certified behaviorists to create their own businesses and get involved in training um, and uh, supportive training for people's individually owned animals to help kind of correct problem or challenging behaviors. Um, and again, veterinary medicine, animal care technicians, very, very common, as well as um, catering to the whole pet service industry and doing a lot of direct animal, um, animal interaction, whether that's animal groom grooming or boarding or walking or something like that. If you're interested in horses, again, a lot of these same um, categories are available. Um, so again, you can work at the governmental level um, involved in inspection and regulation. There's many other roles within the government, but this is just one example. Again, academia and nonprofits again. There are a lot of um, horse or donkey uh, specific nonprofits, both international like Brooke and Spana, um, but also perhaps more, more localized ones. So Gambia Horse and Donkey Trust, for example. Uh, and again, it's, it's very also localized uh, as well. Uh, if you are someone who is again interested in this intersection between how animals can help people and how people can help animals, there's a whole field of equine assisted therapy where people will um, uh, interact with horses um, as a way of, uh, yeah, as, as therapy basically. Um, and that's, and that's a, a booming area um, in some of the places that I've worked at least. Um, again, equine training and consultancy, or you can get involved in boarding, riding, or training schools animal care and husbandry and farm and stable supervisors are all examples of careers involving equines that you, you can use and apply behavioral knowledge. Uh, two, more, two more categories. <laughs> um, next, if you're interested in research animals, um, you can work for industry or for contract research organizations. So Charles River, for example, is an international organization and I, I've known and I know people who work for them who are animal welfare scientists. Uh, Covance and Olenko are other examples. Academia, as always, there are people who are academics who are dedicated to research animal welfare and behavior. Um, and then within in university institutions, um, they need to have some, some form of ethical oversight of animals used for research. Um, and so there are people, typically academics, although not always, um, who are involved and in most of their career is around govern governance related to the use of animals for research. And that also takes place uh, at the governmental level. So in the United States, the Office for Laboratory Animal Welfare is a good example of that. Uh, in the UK, um, the Home Office um, would be possibly something that you would work for uh, in terms of overseeing that. 
nonprofits. Again, there's, a, there's abundant opportunities within nonprofits. Some examples are the Association for the Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. There's also a number of initiatives, including in North America for the three R's, uh, which uh, is an ethical principle related to um, research ethics uh, involving animals. And then, of course, there's plentiful opportunities to work directly with laboratory animals, um, overseeing their care um, as a research technician, dedicated especially um, focused on environmental enrichment or on managing the facilities, and again, veterinary medicine. Uh, and then finally, if you're interested in wild animals that are in captivity, this is uh, an area where many of my students are very interested in. It can be quite tough because there tends to be, at least uh, in the places I have worked before, there tends to be more interest and more interested people than there are spaces available. So if this is something you are passionate about, don't give it up, um, but also be open, I would say. Um, so if you're interested in working directly for a zoo or an aquarium, people serve as keepers or curators or even certain zoos, not all zoos, but some zoos uh, hire people to head their behavior and welfare program in the zoo. Um, again, in academia, um, what might be quite interesting, um, if you're interested in wild animals, um, depending on what your research is, this would be an area where you might be involved in a lot more field work, um, perhaps than it, with some other species of interest. Again, you can work for the government or for nonprofits and charities. Um, and so what you might do with um, a nonprofit involving wildlife or captive wildlife, um, and this goes not just for wildlife, but also for all of the other kind of species categories that you might be interested in, but um, you can work on, on the, the charity's campaigns to improve welfare of a particular issue. You may be serving actually as a science advisor. So I have a number of um, people who I went through my postgraduate work with that now serve um, as scientific advisors for different charity organizations for the welfare of, you know, wildlife or for farm animals or for companion animals. Um, there's also a huge area for wildlife rescue and rehabilitation, although it might be quite difficult to support yourself um, from a, from a, money standpoint, <laughs> um, but not impossible. Um, and again, veterinary medicine. So I'm seeing that there's just a few questions that have popped up in the chat. Oh, but nothing that I'm needing to, uh, to answer right now. Um, I'll circle back at the end. Okay, so um, I wanted to, to spend the rest of this just um, talking a little bit about um, some things to keep in mind if, if one is interested in becoming an academic, um, becoming a professor, whether you're interested in research or teaching or both. Um, I thought I'd just, these are some things that I might have wished to have known um, near to the beginning of my journey. Um, and so uh, I'll just first uh, share uh, a little snapshot into what my day looks like. Um, no day is well, I'd like to say no day is the same, but some days are similar. Uh, some are more similar than others, but um, it's not all um, playing with animals. In fact, very little of it is working directly with animals. Um, most of my days are spent at my desk um, on my computer. Um, and I think this is increasingly the case for a lot of people in academia and not just academia. Um, there's a lot of email. And I've found that it gets way more uh, after you leave uh, university and after you uh, finish your master's and your PhD. Uh, and even if you are a postdoc right now, once you step into a faculty position, the, the emails get a lot more. <laughs> um, you spend a lot of time on Zoom meetings or on Teams meetings. Um, I spend a lot of time with uh, emailing with students um, because I have a lot of students. This would be less if you don't teach very much. Um, increasingly, depending again on how much time you teach, you, you do a lot of marking or grading. Um, this will vary very much depending on your teaching load. Um, you'll also be working on serving on university committees. You should be spending some amount, hopefully more of your time than not, on grant proposals and 
writing manuscripts. Um, and you're also, depending if you're ultimately supervising students, you're going to be doing a lot of editing of other people's work. So there's a lot more writing and computer time than I think I probably would have thought before I kind of entered into entered into this. Even as um, near the end of my PhD, um, the, there's more of it than there was at my PhD level. Um, but it's not all computer and desk time. Um, if you do have any amount of teaching, you will be teaching. Um, and so this is this I like very much. Um, so you might be teaching in the classroom or in the field. Um, that's the most fun, or perhaps online, especially increasingly these days. Um, and then there's there's a small amount of my day where I'm actively working with animals and and doing maybe behavior data collection, for example. Um, so this is just a, a, um, a little video of a project that we um, did a few years ago. Um, that's my favorite because most of the data collection just involved watching um, videos of, of goat kids and, and, and creating um, time budgets for them. So that was, that was quite fun. So there's a, a diversity to life as an academic, but um, I would love to, to shift some of that allocation over to more of, more of this and more of, uh, more of the, the data collection and more of the teaching and less of the falling over at my computer. <laughs> Um, so regardless of which stage you're, on, you're at, um, whether you are an undergraduate student right now or a postgraduate or a postdoc, um, or honestly, I think this is, is the, these are things that are good to think about even if you are later on in your career. Um, when we think about creating ourselves to be attractive candidates for hire, um, at an academic institution. Um, you need, in order to realistically, I would say, in order to get a job as, um, as a tenure track or a permanent um, researcher or professor or lecturer at an institution, at least in the US, Canada, or many institutions um, in Europe, you need a PhD. Um, you, it's going to be not impossible, but you're, you just, you need a PhD. So go for the PhD. Um, and usually in order, before you do the PhD, I would highly recommend doing a master's is a really good idea. Um, some people can go right into a PhD, but at least for me, a master's was really critical and, 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 and I wasn't, I wouldn't have been ready to do a PhD unless I had done my master's first. Um, I'd also really urge people if they can, to diversify where they do their, um, their training. So if you stay at the same institution for undergraduate degree, master's degree, and PhD degree, that can set you um, a little lower than an equivalent candidate for, from the perspective of a lot of hiring committees. Not always, but sometimes. Um, unless you want to stay internal and you, you want to stay at that particular institution. But if you're interested in going elsewhere, that can make it a little bit more difficult um, for the hiring committees. Um, if you do stay, yeah, I would then highly encourage making sure that you have um, different supervisors so that you are still learning from different people and trying to get a different, ex a different exposure, new exposure to different um, teaching styles, different perspectives, different philosophies, not just about the particular topic, but also about, you know, the philosophy of science and how, how you do um, research. Um, so when you, when you are thinking about creating the package that you um, share to the world, that you share to job applications, um, for, an, for someone to be competitive, um, to become hired in academia, they need to be balancing a lot of plates. Um, and so you need to be able to display your research, your portfolio as a, as a whole person. Um, and the, the most important component for a lot of positions, not all though, so there are some positions that don't focus on research, depending on what institution you're looking at. But if you are interested in research, usually the research uh, component is the most important. Um, so that's something that you're balancing. You're also trying to demonstrate um, your ability to teach 
and the past experiences that you've had with teaching. Uh, so those are the, the two most critical, I would say, but there are others. Um, increasingly, academics are expected to be engaging with community and engaging with the public. So we want to make sure that the work that we're doing in an academic institution has impact to the wider uh, to, to the world, right? So that's the point. We don't want to just keep it internal. So we don't want to just be talking amongst ourselves as academics um, about this cool new thing we found in this study. And we don't, even though we, while we're teaching that we're sending students out into the world and we are having impact that way, we also want to be interfacing directly with the community. So whatever you can do to, um, you know, have a public facing engagement is a, is a good thing. Um, academics are also expected to allocate some proportion of their time to service and leadership to their institution, so to the university. So this may involve serving on different committees um, to, to hire somebody or to do something related to diversity and inclusion or to do something related to, um, you know, updating the curriculum or overseeing postgraduate students or, or, or so, so on. Um, so to the extent that you can take a leadership role here or there is really important for your development. Um, it becomes a little bit of a balancing act because the more service you do, the less time you ultimately have for research and possibly teaching and vice versa. Um, so it can be a bit of a difficult balancing act, but you need to have some of it and you need to be contributing. Uh, in some respect, um, or at least demonstrate capacity to do so. And you also want to be contributing to, to your field. So that would be involving um, getting, in, excuse me, that would include getting involved in professional societies like ISAE, um, serving on, on the council, um, you know, stuff like that. And then finally, this is not necessarily something that shows up in your uh, your portfolio, but your ability to take command of the administrative work um, is going to help you balance the other plates um, because there is a lot more administrative work um, that you don't typically see a lot of when you are a postgraduate and certainly not as an undergraduate student, but the stuff related, there's a lot of kind of behind the scenes paperwork <laughs> and planning that go that, that is involved with both research and teaching, as well as um, community engagement and service and leadership. So that you've, you're balancing a lot of plates and it can get really, really overwhelming really quickly. Um, and so I've got some considerations to keep in mind that will, I that help me navigate this a little bit um, and hopefully would will also help you. The first and I think one of the most critical is that you need to have some way of managing your tasks and and balancing that goal setting. So you need to be a really organized person essentially and you need to kind of plan out for yourself how you're going to allocate your time. Um, some people do this really rigidly, others are more flexible but and it's a personal decision. I see a lot of recommendations from other academics um, to make meetings with yourself, like schedule meetings with yourself to write and to read the literature. Because if you don't, every day stuff is going to crop up that you have to take care of, like some administrative task or some other task that, while it's important, it can sweep into your whole day or your whole week and then somehow your whole month is gone and you haven't written anything or read a single paper. Um, and this is this this writing and reading time is is the backbone of staying uh, as a good scientist who's 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 up with the field. So book those times for yourself um, and hold and protect those times as if you were meeting with someone else and you wouldn't cancel that meeting. When you're early in your career, um, say yes to opportunities that you might not think are necessarily directly relevant to like the, the task you're doing right now, um, but 
It could be, you know, doing a guest lecture or helping someone write a grant or working on a paper. Um, say yes to those opportunities because that will help give you new skills, but and you can maybe put them on your CV, but it'll also help you build relationships and hopefully keep them and you need those. But at some point you're going to need to shift because eventually there's going to be so many opportunities and invites coming in and you cannot say yes to them all. You're going to want to say yes to more of them that you can reasonably say yes to, but you need to learn how to say no, because if you're spread too thin, you're going to have too many plates and then they're all going to crash. Um, and realistically, every academic is guilty of it, of this. I don't know anybody who's not guilty of this. We all tell ourselves we need to start saying no more. None of us do, but I'm just saying you should learn to say no. If you haven't, if you haven't practiced it already, you should, you should start practicing. Um, this is also something that I think is really important and is a good recommendation for somebody at every stage, um, whether you are an undergraduate or a postgraduate or a postdoc, or you're in your first you know, years of your career as a, as a faculty member, note down everything that you do. Um, some of it's gonna make it onto your CV. Some of it may not, but it will probably go in your annual review, your annual report that you have to kind of do um, for your institution. And it can be really tough to like sit back and reflect, be like, what did I do? Yeah, like if you write it down when you do it, just have like an open document. Like for me, for this talk, I'm going to write that down. Hey, I did this talk. Um, I may have otherwise, like, just because my mind gets scattered, if I don't write it down, I don't do it. Um, document everything you do. It will help you um, build out your CV. It'll also make uh, when you have to report um, more easily, uh, more easy. Um, and this is something that is less of a, that can be a bit of a challenge, but quality over quantity when it comes to research and maybe teaching, although I know you may not have much control over that, but um, it's better to do, I would say it's better to do a little fewer things well than too many things poorly. Um, critical to all of this is building relationships with people, with um, whether they are your peers, your colleagues, your people, people who have mentored you, and, and, and just generally be good to people it, it kind of distills down to that, and that will help you balance these plates. Um, okay, um, I want to just link um, really quick, especially, uh, I will provide these slides to, to Olasun um, for, for people's interest, but this link um, will be, I think, maybe really helpful, especially to younger students. Um, if you're interested in careers in animal behavior and welfare, I think that might be um, possibly very useful to you. Um, so I'm happy to, to share that. This is a, a resource guide I developed with um, some colleagues um, that maybe will help. Uh, and I'd just like to end with a few recommendations um, for, for anybody, I think at any stage, uh, really. Um, one is especially early on, seek any opportunity that you can get to work with animals um, and to work in a laboratory or a science or a research type setting. Um, there's lots of ways to, to find these. Building your network is a great place to, to start, but also even just on ISAE's webpage under their employment and education tab, people will post, ISAE members will post employment opportunities, internship opportunities, and graduate study fellowships. Um, Seek professional accreditations where relevant. So if you're someone who's really interested in behavior, um, uh, excuse me, like behaviorist, uh, to become like a behavior consultant, for example, consider looking into the International Association for Animal Behavior Consultants and doing some of their, um, uh, to, to become certified as a, as a professional behaviorist. Um, if you're interested in animal welfare assessment, or auditing, uh, consider going through um, and becoming PACO certified, which is the Professional Animal Auditor Certification Organization. Um, also, uh, I mentioned this um, earlier, but be open to working with diverse species. So when I came into this, I was really passionate um, about horses. I'm still passionate about horses, but I had the chance to choose to kind of stick with horses or to diversify. And I, I chose to diversify. So I've that choice, I think. I went into, I, I worked with 
broiler chickens. Uh, for my master's, I worked with dairy cattle for my PhD. And in my roles since, I've worked with everything from goats and pigs to cows to um, people um, and a little bit of, of zoo animal things now as well. Um, and I think that that diversity of species has, has helped me, especially in my teaching, I would say. And then finally, um, I can't emphasize this enough to develop your networks, um, both wherever you are locally, but also online. So if you don't already have it, consider starting a LinkedIn account. Aloasun is the best LinkedIn person I think I've ever met. She's so active on it, it's amazing. Um, I'd also recommend as you get into research, um, uh, start a ResearchGate account. Uh, and then from a social perspective, animal welfare science and animal behavior Twitter is actually quite active. And I've met a lot of people including new colleagues through this platform. Um, there's been some stuff with Twitter lately. And so a lot of academics I've seen have moved on to uh, something called Mastodon. So you might consider that as well. Okay, so with that, I thank you so much for your time and attention. And then my contact information is below. Thank you, Dr. Betts. That was a very wonderful presentation. We have some questions lined up in the chat box for you. So the first one is, what is the difference between animal welfare, animal rights, and animal advocacy? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think different people might answer this question differently. So I'll say that this is just my response. Um, typically, I think that they intersect. There's relationships between them. But for a lot of people, the, the one large difference between animal welfare and animal rights is animal like animal welfare um, is concerned about how animals are doing and understanding how animals are doing in different systems. And there are ethics uh, associated with those questions. Um, but generally, when we talk about um, roles related to animal welfare, it's kind of with the, the understanding that people who work in a lot of animal, like as animal welfare scientists, will generally uh, accept the premise that animals are used in different contexts, um, whether they're on farm or in laboratories or in zoos, perhaps. Um, they may have their own personal beliefs about whether that's ethical or not, but they accept that it's the case. And the goal is not to abolish um, or, or um, remove animals from those systems of use, but rather to improve the welfare of animals within those systems of use. Um, whereas from a rights perspective, um, when it comes to maybe the, 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 the careers within animal rights, um, it may be more, not always, but it might be more focused on um, stopping certain practice or, or, or indeed perhaps abolishing certain practices entirely. Um, there is overlap and blendedness between them. Uh, when it comes to animal advocacy, um, I would say like advocacy involves both welfare and rights um, perspectives and there's a lot of, of interplay between them. Um, some welfare scientists consider themselves um, advocates, I would say maybe some don't. Um, it's not something that I can say, you know, for 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 every person. All right, thank you very much. Ma. There's another question here um, from the same user. At the moment, there's a gap between industry and research. I'm not sure most companies are aware of the need to have an animal behavior and welfare experts in their team. What can be done about this? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's, it's getting better. So like I would say when I started my career, there were fewer opportunities and fewer companies that were um, indeed aware of the need to, to have a behavior and welfare expert. Um, and there are a lot more now. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think it's improving. Uh, but that said, there are a lot of uh, a lot. There's a lot of room to grow. What can be done about this? I I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, I think it it it's it's a larger question in uh, related to how we can introduce behavior and welfare 
more broadly to society and 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 convince that convince most of the rest of the world that knowledge of behavior and welfare is is foundational to to humans way of life um, not in every specific job but in far more than than people think um, and to be human is to relate to animals and if we forget um if we've forgotten this, um, we are straying too far from, from our roots, perhaps. And I think this is where some of some of the issues and the challenges come from. All right. Thank you very much. There's another question here. He's saying there's a growing interest in climate change and how it affects us all. Is there a career field for animal behavior professionals? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, I was just having this conversation actually with um with uh, someone who is a sustainability scientist that he he's a friend of mine and he doesn't have any welfare um, knowledge, but I don't have very much climate knowledge beyond like broad level stuff. And we were talking about how there's there's not a lot, uh, there, there, there doesn't seem to be very much synergy between um, like sustainability scientists and welfare scientists. I think this is a huge, this, I think it's gonna grow, but we 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 have very little that explore this intersection. Um, but it, I think this is that's probably the most important area that we need to focus our energies on uh, going forward. So so Sunday, that's a fabulous question, and I think that that if you're not if you haven't already um, done your postgraduate work, that should be <laughs> that should be the the area of your postgraduate work. All right, thank you very much. Um, just one last question here. Um, out of the industries and sectors that you've mentioned earlier, which do you consider to be the most important? Which do I consider to be the most important in terms of like the sector clusters? Okay. I, oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, okay, if I'm, I will, I will take a utilitarian approach to answering this where I'm interested in the thing that can maximize benefit to the most individuals and minimize uh, suffering to the most individuals. And so from that perspective, I will say livestock because of the sheer numbers um, of livestock and the amount of people whose livelihoods are impacted by it uh, and the fact that it's so foundational to human survival. Um, yeah, but it, but I'm not saying that the others are not important because they are also critically important. That's like right. asking me to choose my favorite child. All right, that's a very fantastic answer. Thank you very much. And 